Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 130. Todd Mead, a lifetime of deer hunting in the Adirondacks, putting pen to paper, backcountry bucks, and hunting with type 1 diabetes. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hey everybody, this is Dr. Grant Woods from Groin Deer TV. You're listening to one of my favorite deer hunting podcasts on the internet. The Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. Hi, this is Jean McFall, finalist of Extreme Huntress from Boise, Idaho. You are about to listen to one of my favorite hunting podcasts of all time, the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. Hello, my name is Jerry Hamza. I'm the author of Outdoor Chronicles, True Tales of a Lifetime of Hunting and Fishing. My favorite podcast is Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. This is Jay Scott, your host, and I am sitting here right across from my good friend. Well, not really across from him. He's on the other mic, Dusty Phillips. What's happening, man? Oh, it's a beautiful thing to be back on the mic, Jay. Every week, brother, we're here. We're talking deer hunting, and there's nothing we really like to talk about more than that, and we get to bring it here, right here on the mic, to the show every single week. Yeah, well, thanks everybody for tuning in with us. Yeah, thank you very much. It's like to be joining you again on your audio adventure. And, uh, D- Dusty, this week we're going to venture out to the Adirondacks again, as we did with the Salerno brothers, and talk to an author this time. This is a, a friend of ours that we that I met uh, at a New Hampshire Fishing Game Expo, Todd Mead, who is the author of Backcountry Bucks, and he spent his whole life actually hunting the Adirondacks out in New York, and he's uh, he's been putting pen to paper for a little while now, and it's, uh, it's, it's a fascinating couple of books he's written. Backcountry Bucks is one of them, and yeah, just a great short story writer. So I yeah, thought it's, it's very interesting read. You know, it goes through some of the motions of his deer hunts, and uh, there's a few things you can learn along the way. It's it's, <laughs> and we, as we discussed this, Dusty, it was kind of reminiscent of our our voyage here in New Hampshire, out in the, the big woods that we took you up on Mount Kearslars, and it, I can relate to that kind of hunting, and you've seen it firsthand now, and it's very much like that out there where they don't do a lot of, uh, you know, there's there's no crops, there's no there's no timber forest uh foresting at all it's just you know you have this big old forest and six million acres i think it is and they just it's just forest that's it so the nutrition for the deer are not great and there's no turnover in in forestry and you basically just you get hit with a bad storm and you're kind of done the the deer population suffers so it's not common to see deer especially even big deer even though they're they are out out there uh, but he has some challenges not only with the terrain and the deer population and and what's there but also todd suffers from type 1 diabetes you know that that makes that that changes everything you know uh when you have a, a diabetic situation like that it's life-threatening even when you're hunting so you gotta you gotta really plan out your hunts and be real careful not to get caught out in a storm or out there and get lost you know it, uh, it can be very dangerous it is fascinating i mean to hunt that big area as he does but then to know that you've got a medical condition that could take your life uh, at any moment because you, you have a mismonitoring of your glucose it, it's 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 amazing, to be quite honest. I don't, I don't know how he keeps track of it, but he, he gets it done. So Yeah, before we get into Todd, Jay, uh, let's get uh, Jim Keller on for the Deer News. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Today's episode, we're going to talk about coyotes and their effect on deer populations. Let's start off by talking a little bit about the word coyote. According to dictionary.com, it can be pronounced as a three-syllable word, coyote, or a two-syllable word, coyote. Both are appropriate and acceptable. Coyotes are also called a prairie wolf. Coyote is also sometimes used as a slang term. It can mean a contemptible person, especially an avaricious or dishonest one. Uh, It's also used to describe a person who smuggles immigrants, especially Latin Americans, into the U.S. for a fee. American Indian legend regards the coyote as a cultural hero and trickster by the tribes of the West. In a Native American language, coyote means God's dog. So as you can see, the coyote gets some mixed reviews. A little background about the coyote. Coyote is 
is one of the nature's most mysterious and misunderstood predators, and they've evolved significantly in recent decades. The declining fur trade has contributed to the coyote's existence in all 48 states and Alaska. Coyotes have been seen in New York City, downtown Chicago, Seattle, Portland, Washington, D.C., Tucson, and San Francisco, as well as several other major cities. And DNA evidence indicates that the coyote we find in the eastern states from Virginia north is actually a hybrid wolf-coyote mix species that is larger and more aggressive than its western and southern cousins. Coyotes are omnivores. They'll eat almost anything, and they easily adapt their diets to their surroundings and related opportunities. Coyote litters can produce up to 19 pups, and they can live up to 14 years. Tag coyotes have known to travel as far as 400 miles. Each year, the U.S. government has to kill over 90,000 coyotes due to livestock predation. Aside from humans, cougars and wolves are their only natural enemies. So what effect does a coyote have on deer populations? Well, historically, coyotes have helped to balance deer populations in the West. However, with recent deer population issues caused by disease and the coyotes' migration to the East, there is evidence to support that coyotes are significantly slowing down the deer population recovery. States like South Carolina, where coyote populations are especially high, are declaring an all-out war on coyotes, supported by their state government. Studies are mixed as far as what effect quote-unquote normal coyote populations have on quote-unquote normal deer populations. However, recent studies indicate that as coyote populations increase, they can have a devastating effect on fawn survival rates. In addition, the advent of trail cams is producing evidence of coyotes attacking and killing full-sized healthy deer. YouTube contains example after example of these attacks. The increased popularity in coyote hunting has also produced eyewitness accounts of coyotes attacking and killing mature deer. Harsh winters with high snow fall rates increase the ease in which a coyote can kill a deer, and the harsh winters obviously increase the coyote's need to kill a deer to survive. So what does this mean to the deer hunter? Unless you live in an area with an overpopulation of deer, coyote predation control will help significantly increase your local deer herd. Trapping can also be done without invading deer bedding areas, and trappers are often looking for access to land for sets. Traps can be checked midday to not interfere with deer hunting. Modern trapping technology creates low risk for herding domestic animals or other species who might accidentally stumble into a set. So in conclusion... Coyote hunting is a great excuse to get outside after deer season. It requires minimal investment to get started. Coyote hunting can be done during the day or night and can be combined with shed hunting or postseason scouting. Check your local laws and regulations to see what is allowed in your area. If you have any questions or ideas for future topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Very good. Thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. And Dusty, before we pick up with our interview with Todd Mead, I'd like to play one sound bite for you that you might be familiar with. Oh, yeah? What's that going to be? All right. You let me know if you remember this. Tagged out in Ohio, brother. Shot a buck tonight. I tried to FaceTime you as I was walking up on it, but uh, pretty cool, man. I got to watch him come all the way across the field. I went out and set up in a fence row, believe it or not. Been hunting my tree stand, been watching some deer back on this fence row about every other night. Went through the waterway all the way to the back of the property, and sure enough, uh, here come this buck across the field. I'm like, ah. Oh. Anyway, he's got a busted rack. I didn't realize that until after I squeezed the trigger, but then it pulled Oh, man. Yeah, coming out to your place, learn me a, a huge respect for <clears throat> uh, appreciating any buck that crosses in front of So, uh, first decent buck I've had. Yeah, there's some giants there, but, uh, you know, maybe next year for the giant, glad to get one. All right, man, I'll catch you up with you later. So, do you remember that, Dusty? Yeah, I sure do. <laughs> How could I forget that? Uh, I can't imagine you would. So, uh, and next year is going to be the giant, is what you're saying. You know, I'm going to put forth the effort and, and spend the time and the money. And I think that I'm going to try to to bust my record next year. Um, you know, it's something that the last few years I've had uh, three little girls growing up and uh, I haven't spent as much time in the woods as I'd like to. But, hey, that's, that's part of it. You know, that's life. And I've got to set in my mind that today that next year is going to be the year that I try to uh, beat my 174 and 7 eighths. So we'll see what happens, you know. I'm going to put the effort in. <laughs> nice, man. Well, I tell you what, yeah, today was – I got off to a bad start today. I, 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 I started to shave, and I cut myself on my lower lip for the first time, I think, in 10 years shaving. And then I bit the inside of my lip shortly thereafter, and then I got a bloody nose. Mm. So my day did not start off good. But So we'll call you blister lips. Blister lips. So hopefully the rest of the people that are listening, if you're listening to this right now, hopefully your day didn't start that way. But I guarantee it's going to be better after you listen to this interview with Todd Mead. Todd Mead, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. What's happening, my friend? Oh, not too much. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we can all learn something from each other here. 
Oh, when I shook your hand down at New Hampshire Fishing Game about a year and a half ago, I think it is, thereabouts, I did not expect for it to take this long to have you on my show. i got to be honest. You handed me two beautiful books, and just, just being truthful, I'm not much of a reader. I love reading as far as content, but when it comes down to the activity, sometimes it just passes me by. And I, I'm ashamed of that because I, I do like to read when when the time is right, but with two kids running around and uh, just everything else in life kind of, it doesn't, it, it, it puts me to sleep when I need to stay awake sometimes. Yeah, I can understand that because uh, people always ask me, well, who's your favorite outdoor author? <laughs> And most people are always amazed because when I answer the question, I don't really have a uh, favorite outdoor author right. because I like I like to read more fiction. And as I've gotten older, I just tend probably not to read as much as I used to. I I'm finding that I'm um I read like I watch shows or television. I'm a binge show watcher. I'm a binge reader. So once I get my hand on something, I have to read it cover to cover, and that's the la- I won't do anything else until I do for the most part. And that's what I found with your books is if it's good, I'm in, and I'll I'll just consume it until like something distracts me that I need to go take care of, like you know there's there's a fire in, in the house or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's understandable. Yeah. But I have enjoyed listening or reading your stories. Um, they remind me a lot of hunting New Hampshire. In fact, um, yeah, a lot of the big woods uh, comparisons, I think, are similar to New Hampshire. I think So I, I think that's kind of why I've engaged in your storytelling. And um, I'd love to, you know, just kind of pick your brain about and hear some of those stories in your own words as you outside of what you wrote and just so we can tell all our listeners about what hunting in the Adirondacks is like. So, sure, I think I can do that. Cool, man. I've spent, I spent the majority of my life uh, hunting in the Adirondacks. That's where I was brought up hunting. Okay. And uh, for most people, they really don't understand it because uh, it's such a vast wilderness. And uh, people don't really look at New York as having big woods. But uh, the Adirondack Park is over 6 million acres. So when you think of big woods, that's... Uh, that's pretty big woods to me. The Adirondack Park. All right. So you're from New York. You're from, you grew up in, or in and around the Adirondacks. Is, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. I grew up on the southern end of what they call Lake George, which is a tourist destination. Yeah, I've heard of that. And yeah. it's also, yeah, it's also about 15 minutes north of Saratoga, where okay. the horse, the horse and the Triple Crown was beaten back right. in August. Right. Yeah. And I'm also, for the older listeners out there, I'm about an hour and 20 minutes south of where the miracle on ice happened in 1980 when the United States beat Russia. All right. All right. That's that's some good geographical perspectives. All right. So I think we got a, a visual on where, where you're at. And you um, you took to hunting as, as a young kid, I would imagine. I can't imagine you not doing that with uh, with all of the the surroundings that you had, all the, the playgrounds that you had, so to speak? Well, yeah, that's correct, but it's. I took a while to actually become a hunter. Okay. When I was little, I always told everybody, oh, I'm going to be a fisherman because I don't want to hunt. And I just didn't, I didn't like killing things. And even to this day, even though I've killed a lot of animals, mm-hmm. I still don't find any, what you would call pleasure in it. Like it, it takes a part, of, a part of me with it when I kill an animal. So it took me a while to understand the difference, you know, between life and death and what it meant to, to take an animal from the, you know, from its place where it lived and stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. No, that's, that's some deep rooted psychology stuff right there, man. And yeah, you know, I, I, that, it really kind of, it didn't bother me when I first killed my first deer, but it, it, it wasn't the easiest thing either. I mean, there's an emotional attachment here, like, whoa. It kind of hits you pretty hard, and hey, you get it. I think it gets easier as you go along, but you never lose that respect because of that first one for that animal ever. Yeah, you're you're definitely right there. I mean, every every animal that I kill, I, I it sounds kind of weird, but I always pet its fur and I enjoy the moment. And uh, it you know, there's usually a lot of hard work behind it, and it feels like the the end of something that you know that you've chased. So I agree. Let's talk a little bit about the the Adirondacks and your and one of the forewords in your book, the the lifetime of big woods hunting memories. The foreword mentions the blue line. What's the blue line? The blue line is a it's a actually like a boundary marker of the Adirondack Park. 
in uh, the blue line is the line that goes that they draw through the middle of the map. If you look at a map um, of New York State and you look at the upper quadrant of it, you'll see the blue line that goes all the way through the you know in the outside of the Adirondack Park, and in the interior is is the park. So the blue line is just the boundary. Okay, and this this area, it's how many square miles? Uh, six million acres. Six so. million acres. All right, that's a big piece of property. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty big. What, what's it like there? Um, you, I, th- I think it was described as big woods. What does that mean? Uh, see, I, I describe big woods to people um, that aren't familiar with it. Is tracts of land that in some places can go twenty miles or more with no intersecting roads. Right. Um, yeah, you'll have big mountains, uh, lakes, streams, ponds, rivers. A uh, little bit of everything, yeah. And it's just uh, void of people in uh, pretty large areas. And wouldn't you think that in an area like that, where you're void of people, and you might have some hunters in the area, but in general, that's a big area to cover. So wouldn't you think that there'd be a larger deer population in that area than than less? Oh uh, no, definitely not. If you if you lived in the Adirondack Park. Uh, you would understand the reasons why. And the main reason is just the winters. Okay. And in the Adirondack Park, they designed it to be what they call forever wild. And uh, that means there's no logging, motorized vehicles, or anything of that type allowed in the in the park mm-hmm. on public land. And what, it, what that does is it just makes it so there's not really good uh, food for the animals. And without the food and then the heavy, heavy snow and the cold temperatures, it makes it really difficult for deer to survive the winter. So the winter kill is is pretty massive some years, and that over time takes effect on the deer herd. Okay. So the deer herd gets gets knocked down pretty hard by the harsh winters that yeah, happen out there. Yeah, especially the last two winters we've had have been brutal in uh Brutal in the manner that it's it's been cold and a lot of snow. The deer can usually handle one or the other, but if they get both, then it, it's like a double whammy to them. Okay. And there's no agriculture because you can't get farm equipment in there. You're not you're not growing stuff. This is 100 percent untouched for for years, except for man on foot. Um, uh, yeah, that that's correct. That's it. That's all you're going to get. So. The, the deer, I mean, in a sense, it's like a test tube as to what could happen or what does happen when you leave things to nature, basically. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Uh, in in one of the areas I hunt, Teddy Roosevelt came out of the woods there, and uh, that's when he basically found out that he had become president. And, uh, you know, thanks to him, uh, well, I don't know if you'd say thanks to him, but yeah. due to him, I guess the Adirondacks became forever wild. Okay. And, uh, I guess, I guess right now, the, as I've gotten older, I, when I was younger, I enjoyed it being forever wild. As I've gotten older and learned more about conservation, I think they should maybe allow selective logging, whether it be by, you know, horse and horse and carriage or whatever to get the logs out or just selective logging, um, just to make the habitat better for all the animals in the park. Yeah. Right. That seems logical and, and uh, what it seems like an effective method for keeping some of the animals a little more hardy. What it, it, it seems like that, uh, you know, listen to you talk that it's, you know, foot access only, that there, there's a lot of wasted material there. Oh, yeah. there. I mean, yeah, there's not a lot of new growth, um, you know, as far as like if you have logging and then, uh, you know, they'll go in there and they'll clear cut areas and then you'll have new growth comes back and it provides uh, good cover and food for the deer. Um I just think it makes it better for the overall herd. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more to that. So, Todd, you you could go anywhere in the country and hunt effectively. You're you're a good hunter. You're you're skilled. You you know what you're doing. You could go anywhere in the in the world to hunt, or you go anywhere in the country to hunt. What keeps you going back to the Adirondacks? <laughs> uh, this is a question I get uh, asked a lot. And what keeps me going back there is the fact that I live there. Um, And if you live someplace and you enjoy hunting, you're most likely going to hunt where you live. Um, I spend a lot of my time, for years and years, I told people I would never, ever leave the Adirondacks. I'm like, oh, I love the Adirondacks. I'll never leave. And I'd always been uh, quite successful in killing mature animals. And then uh, one year I was shooting in the IBO National Triple Crown in archery. And 
I met a guy from Ohio, and uh, I shot with him for the weekend, and I was shooting semi-professional class, and they stuck him in my class, and he was in the hunter class. So his skill level was a little bit less, and he was asking me a lot of questions about archery, stuff like that. And then uh, at the end of the weekend, he says, well, would you ever be interested in coming out here to bow hunt? Because I told him that bow hunting, I didn't really have many bow hunting opportunities where I lived. And I said, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to come, but my dad is my best friend, so I, I'll only come if he can come with me. So uh, the guy says, oh, yeah, that won't be a problem. So then I went out and I and I hunted Ohio. And then when I did that, I started taking my vacation to hunt out of state. And uh, then everything kind of turned around and I got more experienced with what deer hunting is like across the country instead of just in my region. And that kind of allowed me to, to give more opinions that were valued because I had more experience all the way across the country than what most people have. Like a lot of times on social media, I'll see people from different parts of the country arguing. Like I remember somebody posted a picture of a maybe a hundred inch deer that they shot in the Adirondacks. And then another guy posted 150, 160 inch deer that he had killed in Kansas. And then the two of these guys started bickering back and forth. And I looked at it and I'm like, neither one of you has a place to say anything because you haven't hunted in the other person's spot. And then I tried to diffuse the argument, but of course people like to argue. So <laughs> people do but like I felt like I, yeah, but, yeah. but I felt like I had the, the right background to be able to interject into the argument. Right. Because you had been to both places. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dustin, what do you have to say about that? Uh, you know, it, I, different opinions, uh, different people, you know, arguing is not my cup of tea. Yeah. And as far as like one person shooting a, an Ohio, a big, no, let's say Kansas, it was Kansas, a big Kansas whitetail versus a 100 class buck out of the Adirondacks. You, who have ventured to New Hampshire and live in the land of giants, can appreciate that because there are, it's all relative because of the habitat. Yeah. I'm trying to think exactly how I want to word this. You know, it, it um, kill, killing a monster buck is, is such a blessing to me now after being in New Hampshire that it's, it's almost unspeakable how it makes you feel just to have an opportunity to shoot a buck not only a really good buck but any buck right you know we, we we put a lot of miles on our boots in new hampshire and you guys do that day in day out year after year after year for a 135 inch whitetail right and if you become uh, lucky enough to to be become one of the hunters that are successful at, at chasing a deer like that it's uh it definitely is more rewarding than any 200 inch deer that i can say that you can kill in ohio hmm. and then and that that's being truthful for me coming from ohio going to new hampshire and you know i'm sure the adirondacks are they're pretty much the same principle as new hampshire in a similar way where there's not a big mature uh heavy antlered whitetail and 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 Somebody downgrading somebody for shooting a 120 inch deer out of New Hampshire. Uh, it, before, maybe, yeah, I'd, I'd kind of harass you a little bit. But now that I understand how the hunting is, you'll never hear me say another negative word about a guy that <laughs> right. killed a 125 inch New Hampshire buck. I'll tell you that straight up. I think you referred to us as Billy Goats when it was all said and done, <laughs> which is partially true. I mean, we hike up some pretty funky facades and just keep going like it was nothing. <laughs> you know, it's just, we're just kind of used to that. Uh, yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah, exactly. So, so there's, there's a whole new level of respect for you guys out there. And, and, and you know, and, and truthfully, I, I told Jay a hundred times, how, how do you keep going to the woods? And I, I don't, I really, I don't really to this day. And it may take me a couple of years to understand. I know you love the sport and all, but man, that's a lot of work for what it tastes like and is, you know? Oh no, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. another thing too. Like a lot of people will ask well, why do you hunt with a gun? And they look down on you because you hunt with a gun. And I always invite people, if you want to come on over, come to the Adirondacks and hunt with a bow, I'll I'll bring you with me. Right. But I bet you that'll be the last time you'll do it. Right. I'm not sure why I, I, you know, it's, I guess it's not work at the end of the day for me. It's something else. It's not work. It's, 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 a, it, it's definitely a labor of love for sure. And I'm not quite <laughs> sure it is. Well, we'll get back then in a little bit. So, Todd, sure. you, you, during your, some reading some of your stories, you have mentioned a few times that you have type one diabetes. And I would imagine that having diabetes, especially type one, must make it a bit challenging to be out in the middle of nowhere and, and yeah, burning that's pretty challenging. Calorie, calories. What, what's that mean to you? I mean, what is, what's your life like because of that particular situation? 
Uh, you want to know what? When when I was little, I was diagnosed when I was five, and I'm 46 now. So I've really never known anything different. And when I was little, the doctor told me two things. He said, if you want to live a long life, don't smoke and don't drink. So I've never had a drink of alcohol in my life, and I've never smoked. And, uh, you know, it's kept me relatively healthy. But it's definitely a challenge when I'm hunting in a lot of different ways. Uh, when you when you do a lot of physical activity, your blood sugar, your blood glucose levels will drop and they'll drop quickly. And for years and years, I injected, which means I took injections with a needle. Yeah. And then eventually I converted to an insulin pump. Um, so you kind of have to manage what you're eating and you have to watch your blood sugar. And when it's cold, when it's either cold or hot, your blood, my blood, not everybody, everybody's a little bit different, but my blood will will drop because your body's working so hard to keep warm when it's cold and you're expending more energy when you're hot. So uh, I have to be really careful. And one of the reasons that I wrote the books that I wrote is because most of the hunters in the Adirondacks are either still hunters, drive and watch hunters, or trackers. Um, And in order for me to be, you know, to succeed on the level that most people succeed in the Adirondacks doing those things, I would probably have to expend more energy. So I decided at a young age that I would be a, primarily a stand hunter and uh, I would expend less energy that way. In hunting with my dad, he would have to worry about me less because I'd be in one spot. Because if your blood goes low and you become disoriented, it's easy to get lost and right. not know where you are. Right. And uh, I don't know if you got to one of the stories in my books where I woke up and I, I had no idea where I was. Um, so that, that can be a pretty scary experience. And every couple of years in the Adirondacks, the woods are so big there that we usually lose, you know, a person, you know, they'll die because they got lost and never got out of the woods. Right. So I have to be really careful of what I do every day. And I definitely have to make sure in my backpack that I'm carrying everything I need to survive for a minimum of a day. And uh, people take that for granted. Like I've heard people say, oh, well, we don't carry a backpack because, you know, we want to go lightweight and cover a lot of ground. And uh, I can't do that. I have to have a backpack and I have to have everything I need in there, including my medication, just in case anything goes wrong. So it's definitely a challenge for me compared to say what it is for my father. Gotcha. It it's you we took Dusty to Mount the Mount Kearsarge area and it's it's a lot like what you describe and these this is a big place where airplanes disappear and you know they they know a plane went down but can't find it still haven't found it. This is the kind of place you're describing where it's so yeah. vast you to to be in the woods with a medical condition much less just be a, a completely healthy individual that still, without the proper skill set, could mean the difference between life and death. Yeah, most definitely. Like if I if I get caught and I'm in the woods overnight yeah. and I don't have the right things with me, the chances of me getting in serious trouble with my health are it's a pretty good chance. Right. right. And uh, hunting with my father, he he's always worried about me. So when they came out with the Garmin Rhino GPSs, it yes. gave him a little bit. Uh, made him feel a little bit better because if I clicked on the radio, he could tell where I was the last time he spoke to me. Right. So very, it's a lot, it's very comforting when, once you, with that GPS technology, that's, it's quite, I think it, I think it has saved lives, saved lives actually. So it's quite handy, especially when you're in the big, big country that you're in. Yeah. And then, well, I mean, as far as people don't consider this either, um, you know, I tell them all this, but one of the things that makes my blood sugar go the lowest is dragging deer. Hmm. And uh, actually, just last weekend, my father killed a deer on the GPS. We were 1.8 miles from the road, and he killed the deer and then threw his back out. And I had to get the deer out of the woods by myself. And he, he panicked a little bit because he didn't know if I had enough stuff to get back to the road okay. But uh, what I did is now I'm on an insulin pump, so I just unhooked the pump so it didn't deliver any insulin. And then I just constantly, uh, you know, fed myself with the things that I would need to, to get back to the road. Gotcha. And uh, we, st- yeah, we started back to the road, uh, you know, it was pretty early in the day when he shot the deer. And we got to the road right as it got dark. So I guess it was good planning. Gotcha. 
it's um, it's an extra layer of things that you have to remember when you're out there. That's for sure. Yeah, there's a uh, there's one thing that that I, I give you guys hunting credit for uh, tenfold is you're you're able to navigate through the woods like no other. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's true. It's yeah. funny you said that because I was I was actually thinking about you a little bit this past weekend when I was in the woods because I had found this area earlier in the year and I mentally noted it and I kind of marked it and I started in the woods. It was four thirty uh, in the morning and I started in and I'm like. If I can get there by quarter after six, I'll I'll be happy. And uh, there's no trail there. Like we don't. A lot of people will follow hiking trails in or out, um, something like that. But where the area I'm hunting right now, there aren't any hiking trails. So I park on the road and I just beat feet through the woods and uh, I try to mentally note things as I go. And I ended up I got there right before daylight and uh, I thought in my head how many people could do this with a flashlight because the woods look a whole lot different with a flashlight. Right. Yeah. And then actually the first time I ever went to Ohio, this guy that invited me out there, he said, he brought me to a piece of public land. He's showing me around and he, my father was standing next to me and he says to me, now make sure if you come in here, you bring a GPS. Um, <laughs> because, you know, there's been people that they spent the night, you know, the night in here because they got lost. And I'm looking at my dad and I'm like, I can hear cars. Right. <laughs> I'm like, I think I'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, that that that's probably the I don't know, you know, Jay and them guys and, and we wasn't like I we wasn't there 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 was the only time that I felt one time that I was a little bit nervous is when they sent me down in this clear cut and I couldn't find a destination I was trying to look for it. I walked a little farther than I probably should have and you know, thank God for logging trails, but every logging trail looks the same in a clear cut, I'll tell you that straight up. Yes, it does. <laughs> but uh you know, yeah, I, I, I walked Go ahead, Todd. Yeah, and that it's funny you say that about logging trails because the area that I hunt, um, you know, no logging is allowed, so there aren't any logging trails. Right, but yeah, just just fortunate enough that the, where we was at were logging trails. But like I said, they all look the same, and especially ones that's been logged probably for ten years now. But anyway, I, I couldn't find the destination. And I kept walking, walking, walking. And, you know, I'm thinking, man, if I I make one wrong turn here, I could be somewhere that nobody could probably find me. Really. <laughs> And, uh, oh yeah, it can be intimidating. Right, and then then Jay and Greg take off in one direction through the thickest stuff I've ever seen, practically. And uh, you know, you you pretty much got to walk sideways to get through it. And, and next thing you know, they're calling me on the phone saying, "Hey, we're up top of this hill." I'm like, "How in the heck did they get back there?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah, people people don't understand what what you guys are dealing with there. And, and and what I'm trying to say by that is your navigational skills are you know tenfold compared to mine. There, there's there's no woods here in Ohio that I wouldn't comfortably take off in and and be fine in. Even down in southern Ohio where there's some pretty big timber. Uh, you know, I, I can navigate Ohio woods, but I mean, I got New Hampshire. I'm like, man, this is a total complete ball game. Right. Yeah. It's 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 the big woods. It's the big woods as as yeah. described. So Todd, you you spent. Man, you, you've written a, a lot of great short stories, and, and it, a lot of them I can relate to. Let's uh, let's talk about your your book, Backcountry Bucks, for a little bit. There's um, sure the the first chapter in there was called Opening Day Bucks, and it seemed like you were a young man uh, describing some of your the events that unfolded uh, in, on one of these hunts. It sounds like you were with your dad. You want to describe some of the the Opening Day Bucks that you encountered specific to this this one chapter. In, so, something about where you had you had shot shot a deer and you you didn't bring your knife and you waited for your dad to show up. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll I'll start in the beginning. When when I chose a college, I was in high school one day and my buddy says to me, uh, "Well, where are you going to go to college?" And I said, "Well, I've applied here, here, and here." And he says, "I said, where are you going to go?" And he says, "Well, I'm going to go to uh, Oneonta State University." Mm -hmm. I said, there, "There's a college there?" He's like, "Yeah." And I said, well, I'm going to apply there. I said, my dad brings me hunting there all the time. <laughs> so uh, it's on like the outskirts of the Catskill Mountains, which is in southern New York, um, but, it's, you know, mountainous area. So uh, the next day I applied and I got accepted. So when I started going to college there, my dad used to come down and hunt with me. So then we decided that we would go out on opening day and hunt this mountain that my dad had hunted since he was young. And uh, we get up in there. He drops me off in the morning. I go down over the backside of the hill. And then I was pretty tired. And he went down the other end of the mountain. So I'm sitting there. And uh, I was young. I, I think I was like 18, maybe. And uh, the, the I see the deer come along. It's first 
its first light, opening day. I can see this deer coming along, and back then I just wanted to shoot a deer. So uh, I saw that I had antlers, and I shot it, and uh, then I went over and I checked it all out and stuff. It was a spike horn, and then I fumbled through my backpack, and I couldn't find a knife. So uh, I didn't know what to do, and, and in that area they had uh, doe permits so you could shoot a doe. So I'm like, all right, well, I'll sit back down and uh, and I'll wait for my dad to get there because it was pretty early. So I sat down and I fell asleep. And when my dad left me, he had a uh, wool pants and a checkered coat on. So I fell asleep and I could hear I could hear some noise a little bit later in the morning and it woke me up. And I looked off to my right and I can see my dad standing there. And I looked out in front of me and I could see a really good buck there. Hmm. And I'm like, oh cool my dad's gonna shoot that deer so i'm looking i'm looking and uh bang and the deer goes down and i'm like oh i'm wicked excited I, and i run to the deer i can see the deer sitting there i run to the deer and here comes my dad and i'm like oh it's cool I got, I got a deer right here he's got a deer it's opening day and right. uh, so then my dad gets over next to me and i look at him and it's not my dad it's another guy dressed in the same exact clothes that my dad had on <laughs> so then the guy says to me uh well how come you didn't shoot that deer and i'm like oh i already shot one but i forgot that uh i didn't i didn't have a knife i forgot it back at, at home so i didn't want to tell him i was sleeping <laughs> so uh, so i just pretended that i had already shot the deer which i had and uh, so then anyhow i helped him with his deer he helped me with my deer and then a little bit later my dad came back so gotcha. it was uh, one of those things I'll never forget because I can still see when I look to my right, I could see my dad stand there and, like, oh, and then he shot the deer. I'm like, wow, I'll never forget this. Two of us shoot a deer and I get to watch him shoot the deer. But, <laughs> so so our, I never forgot my dad shooting that deer. <laughs> are naps part of the hunt in the Adirondacks? Uh, you want to know what? I've, I've never really napped. Um, I mean, I did then because I was, I was in college and, you know, I was tired and stuff like that. But I, my father naps in the Adirondacks. But I don't, I, I feel like I'm there and there are so few deer that if I close my eyes for a second, I ju might just miss the only opportunity I'm going to have in, in that year. Right. So I, I really don't nap a whole lot. I, I try not to. And sometimes, and I, a lot, I nap way less now than I did when I was just a young hunter. But it seemed like when I was a young hunter, I would sit there still and never see a deer. But the minute I, or then I, when I fell asleep, <laughs> when I woke up, there'd be four deer walking around me. So I don't know what it was, but it just seemed to be uh, the thing. I'd li and then I would deliberately go out and fall asleep, and sure enough, they were they they'd appear. I don't know what I don't know why. Um, well, you'll you'll love this then. <laughs> Last weekend was the last uh, weekend of our rifle season here in northern New York, and we were we were in my uncle's camp, and we were all talking about things that had happened, and and actually falling asleep in the woods. And my brother, who no longer hunts, but hunted when we were younger. Uh, one day, my father dropped him off in this like he told him to get in this blowdown. So my brother climbed in the blowdown, and uh, then it snowed that morning. So there's fresh snow there. And then my father comes back and he says to my brother, "Did you see anything this morning?" My brother's like, nope, I didn't see anything. My father said there were fresh tracks all around the blowdown in the new snow, but my brother never saw anything. Of course, <laughs> that's it. That's exactly the way deer hunting is. So let's uh, let's talk about the bowl a little bit. The the, uh, the bowl is a is a special place that it sounds like you found, and um, it sounds like you almost stumbled upon this bowl. And I don't know if, what exactly it looks like, but you described you called it the bowl. Your chapter is called the bowl. And it was, yeah. it was during, it sounded like you found it during a scouting expedition in the spring and just realized after doing your, your, your due diligence that you found a better place to be that wasn't too far from some of your other hunting spots, but that this place was definitely one of the better ones. You want to describe that? Oh uh, yeah. It, this place was awesome. I, I had always hunted this area, but I was, I'm the kind of person when I go someplace, I'll stay in an area and then I'll take off, uh, I'll bite off little chunks and I'll keep going and going until I become really familiar with the area. So after I had, uh, after I'd hunted in there all fall, I decided I want to bite off a little more. So in the spring, I went back in there when no leaves were on and I crossed this creek and I went up the hill and uh, I went over this little knob and, and I sat down on this rock and uh, and there was this bowl in front of me, like a ridge tapered down off from my left in a, in a flat area tapered down into like what looks just like a bowl down in front of me. And just when I sat there, some of these places do this, but when I sat there, I looked at it, I'm like, this is a perfect place for deer to funnel through. And the more I looked at it, I'm like, this, this is going to be a good place. 
So, uh, of course, I looked around some more, and then I, I went up above the bowl, and then I went uh, I went straight away from it, and then I went off to the right. And uh, every place I went, I realized that all of the all of the terrain in that area, it funneled them right into that bowl in order for them to get from one place to another. So when I found it, I knew that was the place I had to be in the fall. So when fall came around, that's where I ended up. And uh, up until recently, I hunted there every single year. And uh, but then recently, some things around it changed in the in the landscape, and it it's not quite as good as it used to be. Although it still produces some deer there. Gotcha. So it sounds like that's you know that's part of the quintessential uh, pieces of of scouting in the spring that you can still see everything and prepare far enough in advance to find those really good spots that'll probably still be good in the fall because it seemed like there's a lot of deer travel in that springtime activity. Yeah, that's what I do in the spring. I uh, See, our spring here starts later than spring out at, say, Dusty's house. Um, okay. it, out by Dusty, it might be, there might be greenery on all the trees in late April or, you know, early May, but in some of the areas that I hunt with the higher elevation stuff, uh, we might not have greenery until almost late May. So it allows me a little bit more time to get out and look around. And then at that point, you can still see all the leftover sign from the from the year before. Gotcha. It's a good good practice to have for sure. All right, let's, yeah. let's, let's move on to uh, the swamp buck. Oh, yeah, I like that one. All right. <laughs> I'll let you tell the story on this one. Uh, a lot of good parts of that that one. Yes, very much so. <laughs> um, the swamp buck is a deer deer that my dad killed, and uh, we were seeing all sorts of sign in this area. And uh, all these deer went off this ridge, and they kept going out in the swamp. And as they went out in the swamp, um, my father kept saying to me, "There's there's got to be a good spot out in the middle of that swamp." And I'm looking at that swamp, and I'm like, uh, "If you want to find a good spot, you can go out there and find it, because I'm not going out there." <laughs> Because, I mean, this place was thicker than thick, and the, the water was waist deep in some places. So uh, he decided to venture out in that swamp, and he went out in there, and uh, he had a tree stand. He brought it out there, and he set it up. And uh, he tied a couple ribbons on the edge of the swamp so he knew exactly where to go in there because it was so thick that he was, wasn't was sure if he'd be able to find the stand once he got out there because everything looked the same. So eventually he... He found the spot out there, but then it got out there and it was so wet, he just never really used it. And the stand just sat there in this uh, old cedar tree. So then uh, one day I talked to him on the radio and I was going to go back to camp in the middle of the day to check something out, get something to eat, and then go back out in the woods. So when I got on the radio with him, he told me he was headed out into that swamp. And he hadn't been there in a long time, if I remember right. And uh, so I'm still hunting. We have fresh snow and I'm still hunting. And uh, I'm glancing up onto this ridge, and it's about 11.30, 12 o'clock, and uh, I hear a gunshot. I'm like, wow, it's bad out in the middle of that swamp. So anyhow, it turned out that he um, he got up in the stand. As soon as he got up there, a buck chased a doe past him, and uh, he was able to kill it. So then we had to get the deer out of there, and uh, <laughs> we got the deer out, and we got it back to camp, and it was just the two of us that were hunting together. And we had an old sled in there, and we we got it in the sled and towed it out through there. And we were both exhausted when we got out. Yeah. So uh, when we get back out there, we hang it in the tree, and uh, then we we continued hunting. And because I still had a tag, and Dad had his bear tag, so we continued hunting. Then one night, I'm in the I'm in the same swamp, but on the other side side of like a kind of a creek slash river that runs down through there. So uh, I'm in there, and it's about dark, and I'm coming. I'm coming out and I can hear voices and I'm, I'm about three miles back in the woods and I can hear voices and the tent isn't too far away from where I am. And I'm thinking, how can I hear voices? It's three miles. We're pretty close to dark. Um, what the heck's going on? So then I come out and I, I walk across the beaver flow and I get, I get close to the tent and I can see uh, three people standing there and I can hear my dad's voice. And then I looked and I saw that they're uniformed and they were carrying sidearms. Hmm. So I'm like, Oh, okay. So uh, it turned out it was a bunch of forest rangers. So uh, they were coming in to check our camp and stuff. And, uh, they did a bunch of talking to us. And then, uh, the guy, one of the guys there asked about the ribbons out by the swamp. And, uh, he, then he said to my dad, he's like, you actually go in there and go hunting. Um, and my dad's like, yeah. And he says, why would anybody go out there and go hunting? 
my father says, because that's where the deer are. That's where the deer are. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then uh, dad's deer was hanging in the tree and we had filled the tag out, but we're three miles from the road. So we left it on my dad's, uh, like where he stores everything inside the tent. So uh, the guy says, uh, you know, I can, I can give you a ticket for that deer not being tagged. And then my dad says, well, he says that the tag's filled out. It's just in the, in the room right there. And then he says, you know, I could take that deer too. And then my father trying to be funny says, uh, well, you can go ahead and take that deer. He says, but do me a favor. After you drag it to the road, just cut the antlers off so I can have them at least. <laughs> then uh, he didn't think that was too funny. Right. <laughs> so, so I guess that's uh, the story of the, the swamp buck in a condensed version. <laughs> right. Now, t- tell me about Doe Hill. That came up as a, a part of the, the Swamp Buck yeah. experience. What is Doe Hill? Yeah, Doe Hill is an area out in front of where my father was sitting before he went in the swamp. Um, every time he sat there, he'd come back to the tent. And, you know, we always discuss what goes on in the, the morning, you know, that we hunted or the day, if we didn't see each other during the day. And he always came back and he told me how many does that came off that hill every day. And every day, no bucks came off that hill. Hmm. And uh, he's trying to figure out if all those does are coming off that hill and they're going into that swamp, the bucks got to be in the swamp if no bucks are following them. So that's why he eventually ended up out there in the swamp because he wasn't seeing any bucks on Doe Hill. He was just seeing does. And in the Adirondacks, when you're seeing that many does and there's no bucks behind them, yeah. then it's time to change your game plan because something's not working too too well. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Very cool. Todd, one of the things we like to do on the show is to kind of do a gear check. And, you know, this is our – the whole thing behind the Big Buck Registry is really just to dissect world-class deer hunters and figure out what makes them tick and how they get it done. And we'd like to kind of dissect your strategies, uh, if you don't mind, and just kind of see sure. what you bring in the woods with you. And I'll have Dusty kind of conduct this segment. Yeah, it should you be bet. super interesting because of the fact that uh, you have the uh, diabetic uh, – issue and, and and we want to know what's in your backpack when you head out todd okay when i when i go out i have see the problem with me is i've owned every backpack on the market and every year i get a different backpack usually and the problem is every year i get a bigger backpack and then i think i need to put more things in it so i have just about everything in it well, that and, kind of makes uh, sense that kind of, it's like a purse <laughs> i guess right. yeah exactly <laughs> So uh, the the things I make sure that are in my backpack that I absolutely need are my medical stuff. Um, And that usually includes my blood meter so I can check my blood, Um, extra insulin and extra needles in case I need them. Uh, I bring what they call glucose tablets, which if you eat three or four of them, they're quick acting carbs. And they can bring your blood up within 10 to 15 minutes, providing your blood didn't bottom out and you're unconscious. Um, I bring what they call instant glucose, which if you become unconscious, you squirt it in the corner of the person's mouth. And uh, then it you know, hopefully brings them back to consciousness. And I always carry a minimum of two bottles of Gatorade, one in each side pocket, just because, uh, once again, it's uh, quick-acting carbohydrate, and it goes directly into your bloodstream. So after my medical supplies, I always carry a knife. Um, carry a knife. I carry nippers on my side, like little nippers to nip, uh, like brush and stuff like that. It's just one of those things I carry. Um, I always carry a compass or two compasses in case one fails. Um, although I use a GPS, I always rely on a compass. Um, you can't go into big woods like the Adirondacks and not know how to use a compass. Um, so I always rely on that. Uh, I always bring a change of clothes because I'm I'm usually a sitter and. I have to walk so far in the morning that I just make sure that I can change all of my clothes when I get there on the top section. So I'll take off any shirt that I walked in with that's, uh, you know, that has sweat on it or anything like that. And I'll change into something that's a little bit, uh, you know, drier so I can stay warm. So it's just a matter of layering and bringing all the layers with me. Um, I always bring a candle, um, a small candle. Are you sure you're not like towing a trailer in with you? (laughs) Yeah, I'm pretty sure. How big is this backpack, Todd? Uh, right now, I'm using uh, Tenzing 4000, so that's, that's the backpack that I use. That sounds pretty and, hardcore. Yeah, and then I use, uh, you know, a lot of times I'll use a frame pack, but I won't use that unless I'm actually going to the tent. 
and then I'll use a different pack on there. And then I've used the uh, bison gear packs, which are out of Montana. Okay. Um, I've used a lot of different packs. And then in, in the in the little baggie I carry, it's uh, I bring with me the candle, a lighter, and then uh, five cotton balls drenched in Vaseline. So uh, I make sure that I always have them so I can start a fire. Right. In case I need to start a fire. So then that's uh, I usually bring a map, a topographical map of the area I'm hunting, and that's that's usually about it. Okay. That's a lot oh, of the camera. I always bring a camera. Yeah. My backpack usually weighs half of what I weigh. I weigh. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Let's get into a little bit about your footwear that you would wear to, to walk that far, keep warm in the Adirondacks. Yeah, this uh, footwear is big for me, especially having uh, quote unquote diabetic feet. I've had the same pair of boots now for 20 years. Um, and I just this year I had them resold and they're, they're called Schnee's boots and they're out of Montana and they're a rubber bottom with a leather upper and, uh, they walk really well because you can feel the, you can feel the things under your feet. So if you're still hunting or something, you can actually feel like a small stick under your foot before you crack it. Uh, so they're the boots that I primarily use and I use a lot of rubber boots when I don't have to walk as far. Okay. Makes sense. And what was the name brand of them again? Uh, Schnees. S-C-H-N-E-E-S. Gotcha. Okay. Just like for the listeners to hear the name brand of that again, it sounds like a pretty good quality pair of boots. Yeah. Yeah. They're the best boots I've ever worn in, uh, they're for anybody who's familiar with LL Bean boots, they're, they're very similar to them, but the boot that I wear, I think it's called the outfitter in, uh, It's made for walking. It's not super heavy, but it's heavy enough to keep my feet warm, and it has a liner in it. Right, gotcha. So it's it's very similar, it sounds like, to like a snow boot. Oh, yeah, it's similar to a snow boot, but it's not that heavy. Gotcha, okay, yeah, makes sense, okay. Okay. Let's get into your camouflage attire. What kind of camo are you wearing to hunt the Adirondacks? Uh, I I usually wear wool, and I wear uh, either L.L. Bean wool camouflage pants, or I wear... uh, flat green filson wool bib and then on the top i usually wear a variety of different things it just depends on the temperature and the temperature and whether it's snowed or not if it snows i wear uh uh, i wear a scent lock uh top that i have that it's not it wasn't built for snow camo but it looks just like snow camo and then i wear another yeah i can't think of the name of it right now it uh it was built for like skyline and it's they built it in white and I think gray or brown. And then I had the white one and I used it in the Midwest and it was too white in the skyline. So then when I started using it back here in the snow, it worked, uh, it worked really well. Gotcha. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Do you, do you uh, use any kind of cover scent when you're hunting like a spray? Uh, or? Not, I mean, I do, but it's not something that I use regularly. Uh, I usually, you know, I might bring, you know, doe and estrus with me or uh, buck urine. The best stuff I've ever used is uh, Dean Vanier's uh, Northwoods Common Sense. <laughs> That's interesting. So, yeah. <laughs> I swapped we, uh... him uh I swapped him some books for the scents, and then I, I do a lot of trail camera stuff. And uh, his scents, his buck scent gave me the best results in the scrapes that I dumped him in. I couldn't agree more with that comment right there. Yeah, Dusty smoked yeah. A, a Kentucky whitetail with exactly that method. Yeah. So, uh, super impressive. So, Dean, so Dean, if you're listening, you can hook your, your buddy up again. <laughs> <laughs> So we got we got your boots, we got your camouflage. What kind of weapons are you carrying out that way? Uh, I use my primary weapon is a two seventy rifle, which is unique because uh, whenever anybody sees my gun, they always look at it twice because they think it's a muzzle loader. And I use a Ruger M seventy seven International, which is a full wooden stock on it, and uh, that's that's the gun I've used since. Yeah, I don't know. It's probably the early '90s, and it's just basically like it's a part of me. Gotcha. Yeah, that's always that sentimental value of yeah. a firearm that means the the most. So we got in your boots, we got in your camouflage, and your your rifle. And what kind of tree stands are you guys using there in the Adirondacks? Ooh, wow, I've used every kind of tree stand you could imagine. Um, I've killed the vast majority of my deer in the Adirondacks on the ground, though, um, just sitting on the ground next to a tree or a stump, something like that. If I do use, uh, I don't know, in the Adirondacks, I have so many different stands, but I don't even know what my primary stand would be. I usually buy something cheap, like a cheap climber, and then I'll carry it in there and I'll leave it there. And I'll take it out of the tree at the end of the season, and it'll just be in there. Then that way, I I haven't lost any money. If I'm carrying it in there two or three miles, um, then I can, you know, I can leave it there and it'll be there the next year. And 
I won't feel bad if the you know if the squirrels rip the seed apart and all that stuff. You're right, yeah, it kind of makes sense in a, in a sense. Uh, have you had pretty good success with a cheaper climbing stand? Uh, yeah. The, <laughs> the only downfall is like I'll buy a cheap one that weighs about thirty five pounds, so it's kind of a little bit difficult carrying it in there. But as far as stability in the tree and climbing ability and all that stuff, it's uh, they're all pretty comparable to to the other ones. My primary stand I use when I'm hunting out of state is a lone wolf climber. Gotcha. Is it safe to say that you're a goat like Jay? You got a hundred pound backpack and a thirty five pound tree stand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I always people always ask me what I have in my backpack if I have another little person in there. <laughs> yeah, the way it sounds, I could believe that. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, but is I mean it, that's it, what I've always done, so that's what I'm used to. Right, for sure. And, and I'm assuming out there in the Adirondacks that, the, that there's got to be uh, something that uh, you carry or pack in with you that uh, that maybe somebody here in the flat terrain would not have. Is there anything that uh, stands out to you that's way more important than anything else? Oh, uh, shoot. No, the only thing I bring is I make sure I bring uh, some type of rope or uh, rope carabiner or like ratchet strap in case I shoot a deer and I have to get it off the ground for the night in case I can't get it out that night then that way I can get it up off the ground and, and hang it in a tree or whatever Gotcha. Is there any uh, time that you've hung a deer and, and, and had trouble to get back to it? Uh, no we talked about this the other day though my dad wounded a deer once and he tied his uh, get snow camo on he tied it against a tree and then so we knew where it was because it was right before dark and it was in a, an area we were unfamiliar with so he tied it on a tree and we figured we'll go back there in the morning while well, that night we got uh, a whole bunch of snow and uh, we we couldn't find the the snow camo in the new snow so that didn't work too well mm. <laughs> so that was that that uh that garment's officially lost. Oh, uh, yeah, you might say that. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Oh, man. Yeah. Jay, you got any more gear questions? I think I'm good with gear. All right, I think we got the, the layout there. So, Todd, I want to switch to a different type of gear. Um, when, when did you decide to start putting pen to paper about your adventures in the Adirondacks? Well, you know what, this, I've always uh, been a writer ever since I was younger. And, uh, you know, I won, a, I won a scholarship to go away to college for writing. And then uh, as I got out of college, in college, I won an award for uh, Outstanding Poets of the 90s. And I won another award for, in a book called Distinguished Poets of America. Wow. And I always wanted to write a novel. So uh, then I got I got out of college and then I got married and one thing led to the next and I just uh, kind of got off track a little bit. So then years later, I got divorced and a lot of times, you know, to make you feel better, uh, writing is kind of soothing and therapeutic. So I started doing a lot of writing again. And then I was at an outdoor show and a good buddy of mine says, you want to know what? He says, you have piles of stories about hunting in the Adirondacks. He says, you should just sit down and write a book. And I'm like, how am I going to do that? How am I going to write a book? He says, just sit down and do it and we'll worry about it after that. <laughs> so I sat down and I wrote my first book and uh, it was really easy. And uh, he said, just share your stories and we'll take it from there. So I'm like, all right, well, that's what I'll do. So then I decided if the first book sold well, I would do it. I would do it again. So what I did is I just took uh, 10 deer that I had mounted and I said, I'll write 10 chapters about those 10 deer. And if the book sells well, you know, I'll, I'll do 10 more deer because I have plenty of deer mounted. Yeah. So uh, I went to my first show and uh, it was a three day show. And I decided, uh, you know, I just want to make my money back that I have invested into the book because writing a book and getting it published and all that stuff is, it can be pretty expensive. Right. So my only real goal was to make my money back. And then by the end of the second day of the show, the first show I had ever done, I had made all my money back. All right. So I'm like, yeah. So I'm like, all right, this is pretty cool. I think I'll do it again. So then I think two years later, I I did it again. So now I've taken a little bit of break, but uh, right now I'm, I I have my third book written, but it's uh, I just have to paginate it and put all the pictures in it and stuff like that before it's ready to, to be published. And that one's going to be a little bit different style. It's going to be a do-it-yourself public hunting book and hunting uh, public hunting areas across the country. Oh, very cool. That's uh, yeah. That could be a handy book for all the guys that still haven't done that yet. That's awesome. So 
Yeah. Of all the books that are hanging on your wall and of all the stories you've written, is there one in particular that is more special to you than others, more memorable? <laughs> uh, I'll be dead honest. I'll tell you, no, um, there's not. No, I mean, every single one of them is as special as the next one. Okay. And, and a lot of people ask me, well, why do you have so many deer mounted? Why do you have that deer mounted? It's not as big as that deer. And I'm like, I have that deer mounted because I want the memory that goes with that. I want to be able to sit down when I'm unable to hunt. I want to look at it on the wall and I want everything to become, to come flooding back to me. And because, uh, like when you're hunting, uh, the moments go by so quick. And as you get older, the years go even quicker. Right. And, uh, some people are left with nothing like the antlers, you know, they disappear, they get put in a box or whatever. And, uh, this way, every single time I have, a, I don't know, I have a lot of deer heads mounted, but every time I look at them, I can tell you exactly what happened on the day that I, that I killed that deer. That's very cool. Is there one buck that you, you favor more than the next? Yeah. Uh, gee, I don't know. Um, if I favored one, it would be the one on the cover of the Lifetime of Big Woods Hunting Memories book. Okay. Because uh, that that deer was pretty special to me, and that's what really made me want to shoot uh, big bucks. Like that that deer is the one that did it. And uh, and I look at I'm looking at the picture right now as I'm talking to you. Yeah. And I look on the cover, and I'm like, wow, I'm older than my father was in that picture. I'm older than he was in that picture right now. Gotcha. You're you're older now than he was in that picture when you took that photo. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so let's uh, so. if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to just go on a, a quick hunting journey with you if you don't if you if you could and just tell us the story behind the buck on the front of a lifetime of a big woods hunting memories how about if anybody wants to know that story they can read it perfect all right so let's that sounds good doesn't what's, it? that sounds like a great idea so what's that's a good <laughs> good plug for your book what's the um, <laughs> what is the story you're going to tell us i am going to tell you uh, one little story that leads into a big story. Okay. As you know, most of my chapters are. Right. And uh, uh, the the story starts when I was a kid. I was like, I don't know, I was maybe, I'd say maybe eight, nine years older, old. My father bought me a BB gun and he brought me hunting with him. And it was in, it was in the same area of the deer that's on the cover of that book. And uh, I was sitting there with him and I was sleeping against a rock and he had his back up against a tree. So I'm sleeping away and I could hear something and I was too young to know what it was, but it was deer walking through um, the leaves. Hmm. And then my dad's like rustling my coat to wake up. So I wake up and uh, when I wake up, there are two does and they're coming right there to come right by us. They're like maybe 50 yards from us, but they're, they're moving towards us, kind of feeding slowly. Well, they get out in front of us. They're maybe, I don't know, 15 yards. And I, I whisper to my dad, can I shoot him? Can I shoot him? He's like, yeah, go ahead. And I had a single cock BB gun. It was a daisy BB gun. So I aimed at him and pow, I, sh I shot the one doe and they took off running. Of course, the BB probably bounced off her. But uh, that was the beginning of my, you know, hunting career. And that's when I kind of decided, oh, I, I like this. This is pretty cool. <laughs> so gotcha. I thank my dad for letting me shoot a deer when I was eight years old. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's not like Ohio, you know, you can't can't go hunting when you can pass your test and stuff like that and have youth hunting season. So, uh, so anyhow, I have this other story and it, it took place last year and it was, although it's not in the Adirondacks, it was in the Midwest and I was with my buddy, Brian Pino and my dad and, uh, we're hunting public land and I had never stepped foot on this piece of ground, but I kept looking at it on a map. And as I looked at it on a map, I'm like, that's gotta be a good place. So one day my dad didn't feel good. And I told him, go look to find where that piece of land is and tell me what it looks like while I'm hunting. <laughs> so Brian and I are in the woods and dad goes, looks for it. And then he comes back and he picks us up at dark. And I said, how'd that place look? He says, I can't find it. And I'm like, what do you mean you can't find it? He says, there's no road that goes over in there. I'm like, there most certainly is a road. So, you know, father and son, we're going to argue about it a little bit. So of sure. course we argue. So, uh, but you know, we, we agree to disagree. And then I said, well, we need to go look at that tomorrow. The more I look at that, the better I think it is. So the next day we came out of the woods early and uh, my dad still didn't feel well. And we went in there to look at it and we drove down to the end of this road. And when we parked, it was a dead end road. And it was almost like parking in somebody's driveway. And there were a couple of, like ratty looking dogs there that came running up to the truck. I was a little scared of them. But once we got past that, we got in the woods and we're like a hundred yards in the woods. There's trash all over on the side of this uh, logging road. Hmm. And uh, I'm like, wow, this is nice. 
walked a little bit further and we jumped a really big buck. He was off to our right. And uh, when we jumped him, I said to my dad, I knew he didn't feel good. I said, why don't you sit right there? There's a lot of sign crossing the road right here. So he's like, all right, I'll sit in here. So Brian and I continue on. And uh, I found this ladder stand in the middle of the woods and I had a trail camera next to it. And I was exhausted because we'd hunted hard for about a week. And uh, I said to Brian, I think I'll just sit here. I don't feel like going any further. Then I, Brian started walking away from me and I, I gave him a whistle and I'm like, yeah, I said, I gotta, I gotta come back here. I said, I gotta, I gotta go beyond here. I didn't come this far just to stop here. Cause there's still another half of the section of woods left that I hadn't even looked at. And, you know, we cover a lot of ground to make sure we find the best area. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I continued on and then I found one of the best places I've ever found in my life. And, uh, I put a, uh, glow tack in a tree. And then I, I walked to the place. I told Brian, I would meet him at dark. So I met him there at dark. And I said, did you find anything? And he's like, Oh, he says, I found one of the best places I've ever found. Blah, blah, blah. He says, the only downfall was I was taking a picture of a really big buck rub. And he says, as I'm squatted down taking the picture, he says, some guy starts swearing at me. He's up in a tree and he's swearing at me. (laughs) <laughs> he had went so far, he was on the border of public land and private land. Even though he was on the public land, the guy was hunting on the private land, looking into the public land. And the guy was mad because he ruined his hunt, and it's in the middle of the rut. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. So, But the guy came in from private land. He had maybe a five-minute walk, or we had been walking for probably 50 minutes. Right. So, uh, so we decided... We both decided right then, I told him, I'm coming back in here in the morning. He says, well, I'm coming back in too. So that night, the temperature dropped, and uh, it was 10 degrees in the morning. The wind was blowing 30 miles an hour. So we headed back in there in the morning. I'm carrying my lone wolf climber, and uh, all Brian's tree stands were in the woods already. So he decided to borrow my dad's summit climber, and it, it wasn't strapped together, and he was missing a couple straps. So we started going in, and then... uh it was getting late as far as late compared to when I wanted to be in the tree. And I said to Brian, I said, I can't wait anymore. I said, I, I got to go because I want to be in the tree before daylight. So I take off and I said, I'll talk to you on the radio after it gets light. So I take off, I get in the tree and uh, it gets daylight and I look up on the ridge and it had snowed that night. And I look up on the ridge, I see two big bucks go across the ridge right at daylight. Hmm. And I'm like, wow. And they were, they were big. They weren't just, you know, large. They were big. Yeah. And, uh, so and then I, I'm sitting there and I see another doe, a couple does, they come down the hill in front of me and I'm like, oh, deer are really moving today, even though wind was blowing so hard. Yeah. Well, then I glanced over my shoulder. This is about 15 minutes later. I heard a stick crack. I glanced over my shoulder and I look and I can see a, a giant deer over there and he's going away from me along this creek bed. I clicked the radio and I said to Brian, I said, uh, are you out there? And he says, yep, I'm right here. He says, uh, I got seven bucks in front of me. One's a giant. I can't get a shot. I said, well, you got a shooter coming at you. I said, I don't know where you are, but I think it's going towards you. Because I had no idea where he was. He told me where he wanted to go, and I thought I had a general idea. So the deer comes, or the deer goes out of sight, and I'm sitting there. And uh, I'm looking up the hill, and then I, I heard this noise. Maybe five minutes later, and I looked behind me. I can see that same deer that I just saw. It's running back towards me. It runs broadside to me about 75 yards. And then it falls over and I'm looking at it like it didn't really happen. <laughs> I'm like, what the heck? And my mind wasn't processing what had happened. So, uh, I can't, I just can't figure it out. I'm like, did that deer lay down or did it fall over? And it's just not processing. So I, I get on the radio and I said, uh, or no, Brian comes on the radio and he says to me, uh, I just shot at a deer. I think I missed it. I said, uh, do me a favor, go over and look in the snow to see if you hit it. I didn't tell him anything that I'd seen. Yeah. So he says, okay. So he walks over, he looks, he says, oh, he says, I hit it. There's blood here. I said, okay. I said, there are a lot of deer moving. I said, don't go any place because the deer is, the deer is dead. It just fell right next to me. And he, he can't comprehend what I'm saying. He's like, what? Cause he didn't know where I was. Right. He's like, uh, what? And I said, your deer just died. It's right in front of me. Don't, don't move there. There are too many deer in here. And I said, I don't want to ruin a good morning. And I want to at least hunt for a couple hours. He's like, okay. So as I'm just saying, you know, what I was going to do, uh, I look and I can see a really big buck coming. And he walked right past the deer that had just fallen. No kidding. And I said to Brian, I said, I got a big buck coming. I got to go. So I stuck the radio in my pocket and the deer walked under me and I gave it a little grunt to stop. It stopped and I shot it. It took off running. And I knew, I knew instantly when the arrow hit it that I had killed it. And, uh, and then it makes this loud crashing noise and falls in the bushes. I can see it fall in the bushes yeah. and it's in like this rose briar thicket and I can see it. So Brian comes down the radio. He says, 
what the heck was that noise? And I said, I just shot a deer. He said, it just fell right next to me. Said, I can't see it, but I heard it. <laughs> so, so, uh, so anyhow, I said, uh, I said, okay. I said, uh, don't move. I'm going to get out of the tree. I said, I know I killed that deer, but I want to make sure that, that the deer that I saw fall is the deer you shot. So I go down there and, uh, sure enough, that's the, that's the deer that he shot. And then we met up there and, uh, the rest of the day, we spent the rest of the day getting those two deer out of there in uh in two small radisson canoes <laughs> and it was below zero wind chill and uh, i have a bunch of video of that on my youtube channel <laughs> but uh it was it was one of the most memorable memorable days we ever had that one would stick uh, out in my head too that's that, yeah double falls you know running towards the <laughs> opposing hunters that's crazy <laughs> Wow. Yeah, and it was in an area we I had never stepped foot in until the night before. What a and, hunt. and both deer were were really big. Both deer were well over two hundred pounds. Wow, that I mean that's yeah. a hunt. That's a hunt of gargantuan <laughs> storytelling. That's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. it was uh, it was really memorable. Very I have cool. a lot of memorable hunts, but I don't know if that's because it's fresh in my mind, or or I don't know if it's right. maybe because I'm pretty sure that'll never be topped in my hunting career. Yeah, that's that's just it's very unique. I don't think I've ever yeah, heard that it, before. Yeah, and, yeah, and to have one of my best friends there who who shares the same passion that I do, and and to have my dad there afterward and to help us get the deer out, it, it was phenomenal. Right. Very cool. Uh, I've I've got some closing yeah. questions I'd like to ask you, Todd. D- D- Dusty, do you sure. have any other questions for Todd? No, I don't, Jay. You know, Todd, uh, great, amazing stories there. And uh, I did get into reading your book a little bit last night, and I, I look forward to, to many more stories. And the, uh, the sleeping buck is definitely one to remember. Well, thanks. I'm glad you liked that one. That was pretty memorable for me, too. Very cool. So, Todd, uh, of, you're 46 years old now, correct? Yep. All right. Yeah, that's so correct. what would the 46-year-old Todd Mead tell the 20-year-old Todd Mead, knowing what you know today? Oh, man. You want to know what? If I tell people this all the time, and a lot of people look at it like I have two heads. But I can honestly tell you, if I died tomorrow, I could easily tell you I lived the best life that I could have lived. And, uh, I mean, all that started when I was 20. So I'm not sure I would tell myself much different things because as you get older, um, life experiences teach you what you need to know. And uh, without those life experiences, like if I told myself to do something different, then I probably never would have had some of those life experiences. Um so, I mean, if I was going to do something differently or maybe give myself advice, I would probably, I would probably tell myself either to, I go a little bit further back and I'd probably tell myself to go to college in the Midwest. But then again, back then, I don't know if deer hunting was like it is now in the Midwest back then. Right. Because, I mean, I enjoy hunting where there are really big bucks. I like the Adirondacks, don't get me wrong. But, uh, after you, after you experience hunting in the Midwest, there's really nothing like it. And, uh. If I could have spent four years in college out there, I think I could have maybe learned more about deer that would have helped me in the Adirondacks because I've learned a lot of things just about deer because you're able to watch more deer. Right. Granted, they do things differently, but at the same time, you still get to learn uh, deer behavior. Right. And uh, and I I would probably choose a different maybe a different career path. So and I would I would maybe try to be more involved in uh, like I always wanted to be an editor for an outdoor magazine. Yeah. And I would I would probably put more of my uh, you know more of my time toward achieving that goal. Um, okay. You know I I that's probably what I do. I mean I'm an editor now. I'm a copy editor now. That's what I do for a living. But I would prefer to do it in uh, in the outdoor world because. Uh, that's where my passion lies. Like I have three passions in life and they're hunting, archery and writing. So, I mean, if I could contribute in uh, to something with all three of those passions, I think it could be really good. Gotcha. That's awesome, man. So there are a million deer hunting tips out there. If you had to pick just one and one only knowing what you know about the Adirondacks and the Midwest, what, observing deer now, what would you say is your number one deer hunting tip of all time? Yeah, my number one tip would be uh, learn the foreign language of where you're going to hunt. If you're going to get a job in France, are you going to learn French? Hmm. I'm asking you a question. Sure. Okay, so it's the same thing with hunting. If you're going to go hunt and you're going to hunt deer, learn learn the language of the animals in the woods. Um Every animal will tell you something different. It doesn't matter whether it's a blue jay, a red squirrel, a chipmunk, 
a coyote, um, a pine marten. All these animals speak a language. So when they're doing what they're doing, make sure you know their language. And uh, you, you have to really pay attention. But if you pay attention and take notes, you'll find out what their language is. And you'll be able to, to maybe not speak it, but you'll be able to understand it. Like, I can give you an example by what I mean. And uh, just this past year, back to my buddy Brian, who I told you a story about a minute ago. Yep. This past year, I uh, I wounded a deer. So we decided to give it four or five hours before we continued on. And all week, we had never seen a crow. So as we're sitting there waiting, he's like, I think you killed the deer. He says, and then we're just sitting there talking. And then all these crows appeared in this tree uh, a ways away. We hadn't seen one all week. And the crows are over there calling, ca ca ca. Hmm. Well, Brian says to me, your deer is dead over there. And, you know, we both know from back here in, at home, like uh, ravens and crows, you know, they, they go to where dead animals are. Yeah. So I didn't think about it. I was being a little bit pessimistic. I'm like, no, no. And he's like, yeah, I'm telling you right now. Well, we ended up, we tracked that deer around. Uh, that's a story in and of itself. And uh, actually, I'll tell you a little bit of the story. Sorry for taking up so much time. Uh, but, that's uh, why we do podcasts. <laughs> go for it, man. Yeah. But, uh I, I wounded this deer, and then he acted like he wasn't hit, but I could see the blood just pouring out of him. And he's standing next to this tree, and I, I he stood there for 15 minutes, and I can see the puddle of blood from 50 yards away. Well, then another buck chased uh, three does through there, and he turned, and he walked away like nothing had ever happened to him. Even though I knew he was he was hit hard, he turns, he walks away, and uh, he he snort wheezes at that other buck and growls at him, and then that other buck tucks its tail and takes off. And then the deer just wanders away. So we waited all day, and then we started tracking the deer after we heard those crows. We go down through this bottom, and uh, we jump the deer out of its bed. So Brian says, well, let's just follow the blood, make sure that that's the same deer in the same bed. So we jumped the deer out of the bed. We followed the blood to the bed. Sure enough, it was that deer, and it went up the hill. I saw the antlers, and we're like, oh, okay. So we turn around to come back. I'm disappointed that I had lost the deer. And uh, Brian says, which way do you want to go? Do you want to go along the river, or do you want to go down that uh, down that swath of uh, swamp right there? I said, well, let's go down through that swamp. Uh, swath of swamp right there and it looks easier walking so we started heading down through there and uh, i looked to my right and uh, i uh, <laughs> i couldn't believe it i looked and the deer that i i wounded is laying there dead even though i just saw him 200 yards away jump out of this bed hmm. and i'm trying to process it like well, what just happened and then i started jumping up down yelling screaming brian doesn't know what i'm doing and uh and then he's like holy cow he says that's your deer well make a long story short the deer was laying right underneath that tree that all the crows were in. Gotcha. But when we followed the blood trail, a different deer had laid in that in that bed after the, the deer that I shot got out of it. <laughs> so when the deer got out of the bed and ran up the hill, it wasn't the same deer. And we gave up then instead of looking more on the opposite end of the bed. And when the deer got out of the bed, it walked in the opposite direction, which is where we found the deer. So wow. I learned a few different lessons there. Talk about a puzzle you'd have to put together on that one. Yeah, and that wow. was, uh, I'm never really lucky in, in, never been lucky in my hunting career, but that was by far the luckiest day I've ever had. Yeah, that's, wow. So, that, it's, so it's like a the, wild goose chase. Story. Yeah, just uh, know the language of the animals that you're, uh, that you're hunting in and around. Yep, okay. Very good, very good point. Very good, number one. Yeah. All right, so we all have these things. They're, they're items that we carry into the woods with us that <laughs> are good luck charms, pacifiers, things like that. I don't know if they really mean anything, but to us they mean everything. If we leave them in the truck, it drives us nuts because it's still in the truck and not with us. What's that one thing for you? Uh, I actually have about four things. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, have a, I carry this little... I don't know, a little pouch on the front of my belt. And uh, in that little pouch, I have this little Yoda figurine. <laughs> and the, the Yoda is to give me the force and uh, bring me good luck. So then he's he's like the, you know, the all seer. He can see everything. So he's always in my uh, in my pouch. And then I carry a little tiny rubber pig about the size of your, maybe your thumbnail. Okay. And I carry him because I think to myself, I'd like to shoot a hog. So if I put that in my little pouch, then maybe I'll shoot a hog. All right. <laughs> so and then uh, I, I gave this one up because we found it. And uh, we found it on an old two-track road in Colorado when I was elk hunting. And it was a horseshoe. Yeah. And uh, I carried it in my backpack for a long time. But, man, it was getting heavy. And I have so much other stuff in my backpack. This year, I gave it to Brian. So now Brian's carrying that horseshoe in his backpack, but he didn't realize if you have it in there upside down, it drains the lock out. So right. 
Yeah. So he met this girl who was into horses, and she told him, you have that thing upside down. You need to turn it, you know, right side up. Right. And he didn't know that the luck was running out. So that morning, he turned it right side up. And then that morning, my dad killed the deer in the Adirondacks this year. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> so now, one last thing, because Dusty will like this one. All right. Uh, Let's hear it. For years, for years, when I hunted in in Ohio, we uh, we always stopped at Burger King. We got a you know one of those Happy Meal Burger King crowns. <laughs> so then uh, every every couple of days, someone in my group would wear the Burger King crown. So when I wore it the first time, like I got in and I dropped my bike dug off where he was going to hunt, and I put the Burger King crown on when we left. So then that morning, I shot a freaking a really good ten pointer. So uh, they all made fun of me. I said, it's the Burger King crown. So then a couple of days later, my dad put it on his head. Well, then he shot a big buck. <laughs> then, then my buddy Doug's like, this is ridiculous. So I can't believe this. So then Doug decides, <laughs> I'm going to be an idiot, and I'm going to put it on my head, too. So he puts the Burger King crown on his head, and then he killed a nice buck. <laughs> but then uh, the unfortunate part was uh, Doug lost the Burger King crown. So oh, now, now we don't. We lost the Ohio luck, so no more big so, bucks so, for you guys. So, was you actually wearing <laughs> this crown to the woods? Uh, you no, you I know what we wore the crown only when we drove, and then when we got out of the out of the car or the truck, then we took the the crown off, and then I had to sit in the driver's seat. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, <laughs> it's like driving the deer wagon. So the last question, Todd, is. You know, you're a writer. You've written books. These are all great stories to reference and for other people to learn from. What, what, who do you turn to? What do you, what books do you turn to or magazines do you turn to for learning things on paper? Uh, you know, I know I have a lot of really, really good friends who, who are hunters. And I try to gain as much as, from them as possible. Like a lot of people hunt different ways than I hunt. And uh, we, tend, we tend to share our stories. Like I mean, there are phenomenal hunters in the Adirondacks. And uh, I couldn't hold a candle to, you know, to three quarters of them. And uh, I learned a lot of stuff from them. Um, I mean, just a shout out to some of them like uh, Jim Massett, Joe Donito, Steve Grubowski, Dave Williams. I mean, the French brothers, uh, the Chippewa gang, like all those guys, they're, they're phenomenal hunters. And, uh, I get a lot of, a lot of tips from them. And, but as far as reading goes, I love to read North American whitetail. Um, yep. that's probably my favorite magazine. And, uh, yeah, I've always liked to, I, I've always wanted to write like a public land type thing for them, but, uh, I guess the opportunity's never really arisen. Yep. And, uh, then I also like, uh, when I started hunting in the Midwest, I liked Brad Herndon's uh, book, uh, mapping trophy bucks. Okay. And I know a lot of his book, even though it's based on the Midwest, it really, it, it's relatable to back in this area. I mean, it's stuff that I already knew, but then I look at it on there and I'm like, oh, wow, it's similar to, to the way he does it. Gotcha. Gotcha. So Very cool, man. Yeah. So, so Todd, I think that's about it. That's awesome. This is this has been an amazing hour. Uh, it's gone over. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't even feel like it's been that long. Uh, it's it, You write some great stories. You've written some great books. Uh, you've got some other Sounds like you've got some other stories yet to write that need to be put <laughs> put down on the paper. So looking forward to that. And where, if people wanted to buy your books or learn more about you, where should we go? Uh, there are a lot of places you can go. Um, I I own and operate two different websites. Uh, one of them is uh, adktrailcam dot com, and that's just uh, basically Adirondack trail camera photos on there. And I have a bunch of people's uh, comments and quotes who have read the books um, on there. Okay. And you can buy the books on there. You can buy the books on my regular website, which is my name, toddmead.com. And then I, I have a couple of Facebook pages. One is called Backcountry Bucks, which I kind of chronicle my adventures, um, you know, throughout the year, whether I'm in the Midwest or in Colorado, elk hunting, in Newfoundland, moose hunting, or wherever I am, um, I kind of try to, I put little tidbits up there every now and then, pictures, stuff like that. Uh, and I also have the Facebook page, ADK Trail Cam, which uh, sometimes I put Adirondack Trail Cam photos on there. Sometimes they're photos that other people send me. Okay. Um, then, then, of course, my personal Facebook page, which is uh, just Todd Mead, So. Okay, cool. And that's where we can buy all the books as well? Uh, yeah, well, you can buy the books on the two websites. 
Okay. Or, I mean, if you want, you can send me a message on, on Facebook and I can get it to you that way. Okay. And you're also, you tend to tour some of the outdoor shows that will be coming up starting in January um, that run pretty much all the way through March or so during the winter months. Yeah. You, um, sometimes I do it with a display of deer head, stuff like that. Yep. Um, and I give seminars. But this year right now, I don't have anything scheduled for that because I, I devoted this winter to a lot to archery and to finishing the, the book on public hunting because that's more of a national audience. Yep. Then when I when I finish that book this year, then I'll probably be back on the show circuit again next next winter. Gotcha. Very cool, man. Yep. Todd, it's been a pleasure. This has been, it's been just a pleasure for me too. Mind blowing. It's it's uh, it's so entertaining and and just right up our alley and our audience's alley as well. And and I can't thank you enough for joining us. It's been an honor. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it, and hopefully I didn't uh, bore anybody out there, and they'll enjoy a little bit. And if they want to know more about uh, any of the stories I told, they can they can pick up a book or two and read it if they're readers. And if they're not, then maybe we'll have something in store for them in the future. Thanks for joining us on the Big Buck Podcast. Well, thanks again to Todd Mead for sharing all those stories. I still that that story about the the, the buck and hunting with his buddy. How his buddy shot the buck, came back and fell dead in front of him. That he shot a buck and that buck traveled to where his buddy was and fell dead in front of him. That that story was just tremendous. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, to to hear him tell stories about hunting big woods like that just brought back the great times I had when I was in New Hampshire, Jay. And you know, it's uh it's crazy how there's you guys are you know miles away, but yet still real similar in terrain it's very interesting that uh with uh todd's condition that he has with the diabetes and and, and he makes all that work that that right there just uh tells me the drive that you guys really have i completely agree todd todd's one one amazing guy great writer uh, and please check out his books if you get a chance well we're going to be heading to the ata here uh dusty in just a short few days and uh, if you're out there and you're listening and you're going to the ATA, if you would, uh, do a tag us in a Twitter, Twitter post. If you're going, it's, uh, we're a big buck registry is our Twitter handle and just do a hashtag ATA 2016 if you could. And we're going to be traveling down there. Me and you, Dusty, you'll be heading down there. We're taking Greg, our Jeep driving buddy, uh, to, to, uh, make the long haul to you. Then we're going to head down to Louisville and we're going to meet up with our news anchor, Jim Keller. And we're, uh, we're going to just walk in there as the big buck registry and start covering that show. Yeah. It should be real interesting, you know, and then shout out to Jim Keller for doing the deer news for us weekly here. And if, uh, you got any ideals and uh, uh, information that you would like us to research or Jim to research, please feel free to shoot us an email. Yes. Uh, Jim at big buck com. Well, Dusty, I think uh, I think that's kind of wrapping it up. Do you have a Chubby Tines tip of the week this week? Yeah, I do. You know, uh, take care of your landowners. That's uh, something that uh, I actually did this afternoon when I got off work. I took a fruit basket out to one of my favorite hunt spots uh, to the owners and just uh, knocked on the door and told them Merry Christmas and hand them a fruit basket. And, uh, you know, that goes a long way with your landowners. That's a great tip because the landowners, I think, sometimes get overlooked. So if you don't appreciate them and show them appreciation, it's not going to turn out so good once the the next guy comes along and says hey i've got an i got a fruit basket for you would you let me hunt on your land so yeah always always keep that in mind very cool man well thanks to jim keller for the the deer news thanks to todd mead for joining us and telling us all about hunting the adirondacks over his lifetime and uh dusty where can we find you when you're not hanging out here on the mic with me uh, you can do a little bit of social media with me facebook.com forward slash chubby tines outdoors you can look me up at chubby gobbler obviously the winter time the turkey page gets a little slow and you can also hit me up on instagram at chasing antler jay where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic uh, I would say uh, the best place to send me a personal message would be our email, which is jay at bigbuckregistry.com. Uh, you can always check this show out over at the Outdoor Podcast Channel. You can find them on iTunes or at outdoorpodcastchannel.com. And we'll be hanging out with a bunch of other podcasters down there at the ATA, get a little podcaster meetup. And uh, so if you're, you're into that, just, again, send us a tweet at uh, – Big Buck Registry and hashtag ATA2016. Also want to let you know we're going to be on the Working Class Bow Hunter towards the end of January. So be sure to tune in and check that out. You can find us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. You can always give us a call at 724-613-2825 if you just shot a Big Buck or want to tell one of your fantastic deer stories from the, this prior season. And if you would, if you are listening to this show on an Apple device, if you wouldn't mind, just hit that subscribe button right there and if you like this show 
do the do a search for the Big Buck Registry and hit the review and give us a five star if you love the show. Well, I think that's just about it, Dusty. Big Buck, Big Buck, everywhere a Big Buck. buck. Excellent. Well, I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait. 